Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. Good morning again, church. Go ahead and give that last hug, fist bump, handshake. As uh, Monica shared, a little different flow today. Uh, We're going to do a little more worship at the end, and uh, it's very purposeful in that as we continue our Summer of the Spirit series, this morning is on worship. Um, And so Mike's going to bring us a word on worshiping in the Spirit and we thought it'd be fitting to have more of a time response after. Before Mike comes up, though, just a couple quick announcements. One is put June 30th on your calendar. That's the date for our next Kingdom Come, a uh, prayer and worship uh, service that we do uh, during the week. Um, and so we're going to have that with more details to come in the, in the future weeks, but June 30th, get that on your calendar. And also, we have a couple ways uh, to give here at Radiant. want to highlight that. First, there's a couple boxes in the back on both sides of the sound booth, uh, but then also on the Church Center app. Um, and we highlight that really as a part of a worship service because our giving back to the Lord is a way He invites us into worship, a way to be open-handed with our resources, with what He's given us to give back to Him, to participate with not just our time and our effort, but also with our resources and what he's doing in his kingdom. So with that, Mike, would you come up? We'll pray for you and let you roll. Lord, thanks for uh, just this chance this morning to uh, hear from your word and, and just to hear it through Mike, through what he's got for us, what you put on his heart. We ask that you would bless the words that come out of his mouth, uh, that you would Lord, open our hearts and open our ears to hear you this morning, and that we would just learn how to go deeper with you in spirit-filled worship, Lord. We ask this in your name. Amen. 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 Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Like Gunnar said, uh, this morning we're going to be looking at what spirit-filled worship is and how it might affect us as a gathered group of believers. We're in a series on the Holy Spirit this summer that we've called creatively, wait for it, Summer of the Spirit. I mean, that took hours and hours. I'm kidding. We probably thought about it for five minutes. But as a church, we always want to give ourselves over to God, the Holy Spirit. But this summer, especially, we want to focus on what a life lived in the Spirit is. And um, if I haven't met you yet, my name is Mike. I get to serve on staff here as the operations director, which means I help things operate, which means I do just about anything and everything needed, including when the pastor's out of town, I teach on a Sunday. So um, Travis is actually out of town in Corvallis, Oregon. Uh, He's up there speaking at a church, Christ Church, which is a part of our family of churches called Confluence. So they invited him up there. They're doing a couple of sessions today and tomorrow on the Holy Spirit. Um, so I wanted to just pause, if we could, as a church, and pray for them, for Christ Church. I know you have, probably haven't met anybody from Christ Church, but you have friends and family up in Corvallis, Oregon. So let's pray for Travis and Tiffany, who are up there, and for that church, um, who's led by John Orton and uh, his wife, Hannah. So, uh, Jesus, we thank you for adopting us into your family, Lord, bringing us into a home. And especially, Lord, you've, you've knit us together with other churches, and we're grateful for that. We thank you for your work up at Christ Church in Corvallis. We pray for a strengthening this weekend, that they'd be encouraged, that their leadership team would be built up and strengthened. Lord, I pray you'd bless uh, Travis and Tiffany as they minister up there. Lord, we thank you for the connection up in Corvallis, and we pray that your kingdom work would extend up there. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so we're going to be looking at two scriptures today, one out of Ephesians 5. That will be the first one we look at, Um, and also out of the book of John. Like I said, we're paying attention today to what spirit-filled worship looks like, and I hope that today you'll see that spirit-filled worship reflects the nature and character of God as we glorify and enjoy Him. Now, I know when we say the word um, worship, that can mean 
10 different things to 10 different people. So just for the sake of speaking the same language, here's how I would define spirit-filled worship. Worship is glorifying and enjoying God that is awakened, energized, and sustained by the Spirit of God. Or in other words, worship is when God helps you experience Him and make a big deal of Him. Because that's what we mean by glorifying. We're making a big deal of Him. Glorifying means giving credit where credit is due, putting someone or something on display. The word glory, when we speak of God's glory, we're speaking of the weightiness of his worth, like the, just the presence of who he is. So glorifying God means to point out how good and amazing God is. When we say enjoying, uh, like worship is enjoying, we're speaking of savoring God, taking him in, basking in in his goodness. So worship is both putting him on display, but also experiencing him, experiencing him, enjoying him. Now you might be thinking, I'm not much of a worshiper. That's not my thing. My favorite part is when the singing is over and I can sit down and drink coffee and listen. Um, I don't blame you, uh, but you're probably putting worship in a category that it doesn't belong. Uh, you're probably thinking of worship strictly as a religious experience or exercise. If you don't think you're a worshiper, just watch your team score the winning run in the World Series, and you instantly become a worshiper. You instantly become energetic, and you're putting them on display. Or if you don't think you're a worshiper, eat a perfectly cooked filet that is just covered in melted butter. I mean, come on. If that doesn't make you worship, I don't know what will. Uh, Or just walk into Yosemite Valley And you become a worshiper because you're drawing attention. You're putting on display that center fielder or that chef or that farmer who raised that beef uh, or that formation of granite, right? You are glorifying what is worth glorifying. You're putting something on display that you're enjoying. That's what worship is. So it's not a question of if you're going to worship. The question is who you're going to worship and how you're going to worship him. So our aim today and always as a church is to be spirit-filled worshipers where our glorification and enjoyment is of God, and we put him on display in a way that reflects who he is. So because that's what we're going for, our times of gathering as a church will often be lively and demonstrative and maybe a little bit spontaneous, and in the book of Ephesians, we're going to get a picture of how that looks for a group of believers. So Ephesians chapter 5 Um, Starting in verse 15, the Apostle Paul's writing to this church in Ephesus and writes, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody to the Lord from your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So maybe you grew up in a church just like this, and this is no big deal to you. But in case you didn't, and this is strange, and you're wondering why do people sing this way or uh, raise their hands that way, I want you to know I can relate to you because um, this is not the sort of church service I grew up in. I grew up in a church where the services were about an hour long, uh, certainly no more than that. Um, There wasn't much spontaneity. I certainly don't remember people lifting their hands or arms during worship, and only particular people spoke from the front, and that's how I grew up. Now, that is a church that I still have great love for, and I'm so appreciative for the deposit of faith that, uh, that I received as a young person. But um, I just want you to know that this is not uh, normal or natural to me. And on top of that, I have a personality type that uh, isn't that into spontaneity. I don't like spontaneity. I actually like when things go as planned. I love being able to plan. Uh, I also don't naturally love um, speaking about my feelings in a deep and meaningful way. That's not how my personality is wired. So you put those two things, two things together, and spirit-filled worship is not what you'd call natural to me. So if you're just making up that, hey, everybody here is just into this stuff, and I'm not, uh, I can relate to you. And that's maybe not true. There is a way for you to grow 
in that. Now, uh, when I was in middle school, my older brother went to something called YWAM, which, um, and then he came back to our Lutheran home with an acoustic guitar and these CDs from a group called Vineyard, and he uh, had a really different experience in his walk with God than I was used to. And so he took me to this youth group at a place called Savior's Community Church. Uh, and if you know the history of Radiant Church, you know that Radiant was planted out of Savior's, and then we merged back together. So uh, that was my first uh, connection point there. So I went to this youth group thinking I was going to either a really fun like pizza party or a church service. Those were the two categories I had. And I walked into this room and it completely blew me away because of how different it was. The lighting was really low. The songs went on for an hour, not just the whole service. I mean, it was like an hour of singing. There was people my age there who were clapping and lifting their hands and smiling and happily enjoying God and crying with their faces on the ground. And so I simultaneously wanted to leave right away and come back every week. I wasn't sure what was going on. It was a completely different experience for me. So then over my high school years, I kept going to this youth group. I started growing in my experience of God and learning to worship him in a more free and demonstrative way. I learned how to lead worship and lead others into worship. Um, And I remember the first time I lifted my hands in worship, and I was convinced I looked like an idiot, and that everybody in the room was looking right at me. And to my surprise, it started to become way more comfortable and normal and natural, and I found out nobody actually noticed that I had my hands up or didn't because they were too focused on Jesus and worshiping him. I remember the first time uh, receiving the the gift of speaking in tongues and how I was convinced that God was going to take control of my body and make my tongue move in a weird way, and I was going to lose control. And to my surprise, it was much more like learning a language where I was participating with the Holy Spirit in communicating back to God in a way that was fruitful for my soul, although my mind couldn't comprehend it. I remember learning to sing to Jesus alone in my room and how awkward that felt to hear my shaky voice sing songs that were new to me or songs that I was even making up from my my heart. And I especially remember over that season of my life, the nearness of God's spirit. Every time I stepped out into something I thought would kill me or just make me look completely silly or ridiculous, God's spirit drew near me and strengthened, awakened, energized my worship of him. So I can attest to uh, the fruitfulness and benefits of living a life of spirit-filled worship of Jesus. It is a worthwhile endeavor to give your time to, even if it's not your personality type or your background. It is a wonderful thing to learn how to enjoy and glorify Jesus in a way that is sustained by the Holy Spirit. So all this to say, if you're brand new to Jesus and this church thing, or maybe you've been at this for decades, I can relate to you. So if you feel awkward as we sing, good. Or if you feel maybe tired because it's the same, you've been at this for 10, 20 years, good. Or maybe you have like a million questions about why we do this or don't do that or sing this, good. Let the awkwardness, the tiredness, The questions draw you closer to Jesus. Because as you do that, I guarantee his spirit will draw near to you and strengthen and equip you. So don't get hung up on things, but give yourself to Jesus and let him lead you into what he has for you today. So before we unpack that text in Ephesians, I want to look at a bigger picture of what worship is from uh, the book of John. This is John chapter 4. So in John chapter 4, we get a story of Jesus who's taking a journey on foot, and he goes through a region called Samaria, which uh, is a place he shouldn't be. As a good Jew, he was not supposed to go to Samaria because the Samaritans were referred to as dogs and people that Jews were not supposed to interact with. So here Jesus is in Samaria, where he shouldn't be, and he finds a well to get a drink from, and he meets a woman and starts talking to this woman who he shouldn't be talking to, and he asks her for a drink of water. And then in a way that only Jesus can, he uses this request for water to get at some deeper questions and needs in her heart. And he tells her, if you knew who was asking you for water, you would ask me for water because I have something called living water. Well, this gets her attention. She said, I want to find out more about this living water. And he says, great, go get your husband and I'll tell you all about it. She says, well, I I don't have a husband. And then Jesus prophetically replies, he says, you're right. You've had five husbands. 
And the man you're currently living with is not your husband. Well, this woman immediately feels busted. She realizes something bigger is going on here than a request for water. And she's, uh, she calls him a prophet and starts asking about the best place for her to worship. She's having like a church experience here at the well because this man knew something about her life that nobody else did. And here's Jesus' reply to her. This is in John chapter 4, verse 21. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman hears that word salvation and she immediately asks him, I've heard of a savior, a Messiah who's coming. Can you tell me about him? And then Jesus looks right at her and says, I who speak to you am he. I who speak to you am he. So what what does this interaction at the well have to do with our church services? Well, I think it has everything to do with what we're doing as worshipers today. Do you see how Jesus engages her mind and her heart simultaneously? She has questions about God and the places she's supposed to worship, and he communicates to her there. But he also gets into her heart and these, this deeper need to be known and unashamed and, and, and speaks to her at a heart level as well. Because Jesus tells us to be a worshiper of God, you must worship him in spirit and truth. And I, I take that to mean we must engage our minds and our hearts fully. Listen to this quote from John Piper from his book, Desiring God, which I highly recommend if you're looking for some summer reading. It's not light summer reading. This is not like poolside reading, but it is very much worth it. John Piper writes, truth without emotion produces dead orthodoxy and a church full or half full of artificial admirers, like people who write generic anniversary cards for a living. On the other hand, emotion without truth produces empty frenzy and cultivates shallow people who refuse the discipline of rigorous thought. But true worship comes from people who are deeply emotional and who love deep and sound doctrine. Strong affections for God, rooted in truth, are the bone and marrow of biblical worship. Strong affections for God, rooted in truth, are the bone and marrow of biblical worship. As Jesus said, these are the kind of worshipers the Father is seeking. Strong affections for God, rooted in truth about God. This kind of worship reflects who God is rightly. That means that none of us can get off the hook with personality types that aren't that into feelings. Nor can we get off the hook with schedules that aren't that into studying God's word. This isn't, this isn't to mean like half the church should be into the word and half the church should be into the spirit. That's not what Jesus is communicating. True worshipers worship God the Father in spirit and in truth. This is why spirit-filled worship, I think, reflects who God is. And when you read a story like that about Jesus, you start to see how massive worship is. And it's true. On a macro level, worship is your whole entire life lived to the glory and enjoyment of God. So whether you eat or sleep or play or work or stand up, sit down, or uh, it's, it, all of it done to the glory of God is worship. Worship in this regard is a 24-7 activity. But we don't just mean everything when we're speaking of worship. When we say worship, we mean particular things. And in particular, we mean this gathering on a Sunday. This is a special gathering that is a worship gathering. So it is not just three, the three songs on a Sunday. It's actually everything we do from the beginning to the end. So yes, the singing, but the study of the scripture is worship. When we give money, it's worship. Those people who are serving our kids in the kids' ministry are worshiping. Like this whole thing that we do on a Sunday is worship. But when we say the words worship, we often mean the singing, right? I mean, we, that's typically what we refer to. And that's for good reason, as we're going to see in the book of Ephesians. So worship is more than singing, for sure. But it's not less than singing. So if you struggle with singing, or maybe you don't like singing in public, um, again, I understand how you feel. 
but I would encourage you to be stretched because there's something special in the way God has ordained worship to include singing and songs coming from our hearts. So let's look at that in the Ephesians text. Here's Paul's given us a glimpse of what spirit-filled worship looks like in a group of believers. First, I love at the beginning of the section, his exhortation to them to not be foolish. It says, be wise. Don't be foolish. Make the best use of your time. And I like that that's connected to worship because it's almost as if he's saying, it's a wise thing to worship God in a spirit-filled way. So if you, like I used to think, think it's a little bit silly to sing out loud or look that happy about God or raise your hands in that way, um, I would just say to you, it's a wise thing to worship and use your time in this way. It is actually making a good use of your time. And then Paul gets into what spirit-filled worship looks like when believers gather. And there's a few things to note about what it means to be spirit-filled, which I think is what Paul's primary concern is here. He knows uh, that worship emanates from within, from the heart. So he's concerned that they would be filled with the Spirit. Don't just act in a worshipful way, um, but to be filled with the Spirit. So what is this being filled with the Spirit? Well, according to Paul, being filled with the Spirit is powerful, it's continuous, and it's a command. It's powerful, it's continuous, and it's command. It's, a, it's, it's powerful, uh, and we see that it's powerful as Paul compares it to being drunk with wine. Now, it's an interesting analogy to draw when you're encouraging a group of believers to worship, to, to, to say, don't get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. So what is going on here? How is being drunk connected to being filled with the Spirit? Well, I, I think the issue here is influence. Influence. Both being drunk and being filled with the Spirit are powerful influences on your behavior. I don't think Paul is comparing the resulting behavior of drunkenness and being filled with the Spirit. I don't think that's what he's getting at. But he is saying, if you want to be influenced, if you want your behavior to be influenced by something, let it not be wine, but let it be the Spirit. Because as you're filled with the Spirit, you'll experience the powerful transformation of your desires, your character, and your behavior into the image of Christ. Being filled with the Spirit is a powerful experience. So you don't have to worry about staggering or losing control or looking like a drunk person, but you will experience a powerful transformation as you're filled with the Spirit. Next, uh, being the filled with the Spirit is continuous. Uh, that verb, be filled, doesn't come through real well in our English translations, but in the original language, it was, there's, there's a continuous nature to that word. So it's as if, as if Paul is saying, be filled and keep being filled. So being filled with the Spirit isn't a one-time thing that happens at salvation or later on. No, it's meant to be an ongoing experience for the follower of Jesus. Paul is telling them, be filled and keep being filled. It's meant to be an ever-present reality for us as followers of Jesus, that we would continually be filled. I've tried in my daily prayer routine to incorporate that prayer, Holy Spirit, fill me afresh today. Fill me afresh today. I, I dare you to do the same thing and see what happens. Just ask him, to be filled afresh. It's a good and continuous thing for us to do. Uh, Lastly, being filled with the Spirit is a command. Paul is not suggesting to the Ephesian church that they consider maybe sometime if they're feeling up for it or they maybe get around to it eventually, they become open to possibly being filled with the Spirit. That's not the language of Paul. He is saying, quite frankly, be filled. It's a command. And it's a command not to worship leaders or church leaders, or certain personality types. It's to each of us, all of our personality types, all of our church backgrounds, all of our experiences, the command is to be filled. And I get command language can feel a little heavy. We're like, man, why is God commanding us to be filled with the Spirit? Isn't that kind of counterproductive? You know, aren't we supposed to be free in the Spirit? Why is He commanding? I get that. But this command is akin to being commanded by your mom on Thanksgiving to eat and keep eating. And why not you have some more? Oh, and did you get enough of, I mean, that's the command. The command is not some heavy thing or some rigid thing like to eat more vegetables or jog more. I uh, apologize if you're super into veggies or jogging. But um, the command here is to have life and life abundantly. That's how good God is. He is insisting that we have life and life 
abundantly. So then what's the effect when we're filled with the Spirit? The effect, as we'll see as we gather in worship, will be that we'll be speaking to one another in various types of songs. We'll be expressing gratitude, and we'll be walking in mutual submission. That's the effect of uh, being filled with the Spirit on our gathered times of worship. So let's work in reverse order here. What does submitting to one another have to do with us getting together to worship Jesus? You probably know this, but it's quite possible to worship Jesus on your own. And it's actually a great thing to do. I would recommend during the week you worship Jesus on your own. And it's actually a little bit easier to do that. You don't have to get dressed and see people and sing the songs that they picked for you. You can worship Jesus according to your own tastes and preferences. And I recommend that. But like I said, there's something specially uh, beneficial to us gathering once a week. And in order to do that, we have to submit to one another. So we submit to the worship leaders who have prayed about what songs to lead, and they've practiced them to make them sound good. We've, we submit to the, the, the elders who've picked the texts that we're going to study. The generous people who are serving our kids this morning are submitting to the needs of others and putting their needs ahead of their own. When we give money, we're, that's an act of submission, because I'm sure we could all use the extra cash, but we're walking in obedience to Christ and generosity to others. Or even our interactions with one another on a Sunday, you have to be submissive, right? In order to listen generously to somebody and put their needs ahead of your own and maybe pray for them or encourage them, we have to be walking in submission to one another. Gathered worship, spirit-filled worship just doesn't work if we're all trying to do things in our own way on our own time. That's for the rest of the week when we can worship and love Jesus in those ways. But as we gather, we walk in submission to one another. The other effect of being spirit-filled is that gratitude will mark our words and behavior, and especially our songs. At the heart of worship is thankfulness. It is virtually impossible to worship God if we're hung up on how things aren't going well or the things that didn't go right. If we're focused on what we do not have, our hearts will be more gripped with complaints than worship. And I'm not saying it's easy to do. I find it very easy to complain and focus on what's not going right. But as we're filled with the Spirit daily, we notice that our hearts are changed, shifted away from complaint toward gratitude, and that should mark our times of worship where we thank Jesus for what he has done and thank him for what he's promised to do. Gratitude will mark the life of a Spirit-filled church as we worship. And then finally, a Spirit-filled worship Uh, gathering will result in us addressing one another in various types of songs. Again, we see here the power of corporate worship getting together because there's something powerful, something I, I need to hear you worship God. And you need to hear me worship God. There's something edifying about hearing one another worship God. So I don't know if Paul is saying like that literally we're supposed to go around and sing to one another, if that's what he means by addressing. I wasn't there That would be an interesting experience, but what I certainly take it to mean that in the presence of one another, we are singing all kinds of songs because it's good for us to do that. So why three types of songs? What's the difference between psalms and hymns and spiritual songs? Well, I think psalms refer to what it sounds. It's the the book of psalms. So right in the middle of your Bible is a book called Psalms, and this is the divinely inspired word of God. This has been the song book for the church for centuries, and... um, This, I think, is what Paul is talking about. That spirit-filled worship will incorporate the Psalms. God's inspired, God has inspired these words to teach us how to thank him, how to praise him, how to worship him in all kinds of seasons. So that will mark the life of a spirit-filled church, singing the Psalms. What are the hymns? Now, currently, we talk, when we say hymns, we mean like the old songs, right? That's what a hymn is. It was the songs that were written before I was alive. But I think what Paul's getting at here, hymns are those songs that have been composed ahead of time by people for the benefit of the church. So the songs that we sing on the screens are the hymns, the ones that we've prepared, the ones that unify us because we can all learn these and sing them together. Those are the hymns. We can't all sing our own thing all the time. That would be chaotic. So there's the hymns that teach us to love Jesus together. Now, these aren't divinely inspired words, but they can and often are be anointed by God 
and to be used in powerful ways to lead us into worship. Those, I think, are the hymns that should mark the life of the church. What are the spiritual songs? I think the spiritual songs are the spontaneous, uh, unplanned songs that kind of bubble up out of our heart as we're loving and worshiping Jesus. So if you've been around Radiant for any amount of time, you've probably experienced this, where the worship leaders will start singing a song that's not on the screens. Maybe that's happened to you. That is a spiritual song. And so when that happens, obviously the words aren't up on the screen, but the best thing to do is not look around and wonder if the person running the slides fell asleep or sit down and think, oh, cool, I have the rest of the song off. I can sit down. Um, the best thing to do when a spiritual song is being brought forth is to maybe close your eyes and just let their love of Jesus minister to you and let their love of Jesus help you love Jesus. Or even better still, try to join them in singing it. If it's repetitive enough, you can sing along with them. Or the best ever would be let their, when somebody's bringing a spontaneous song of worship, a spiritual song, let that be your permission to sing your own song to God, which again, I know how awkward and uncomfortable that can be at first, but I also can tell you it is an amazing gift of God to just not just say why you're thankful to God, but put it to a melody. Something connects head and heart when we sing it. Uh, and I think that's what Paul's getting at when he's talking about that spiritual songs should mark the church. So all three of these songs, but a particularly singing will mark the life of a spirit-filled church. That's why we sing. It's not because we couldn't figure out something else to do for 30 minutes on a Sunday. There's something powerfully important about being uh, spirit-filled worshipers, worshiping in spirit and truth through all kinds of songs. So we're going to do that now. I'm going to invite the worship team uh, back up. Uh, we, I, I asked them to put the bulk of their songs toward the end of the service. I know Normally when the talking is done, that's your cue that the church service is almost over, but it's not. We still have like 25 minutes together. Yes. So we're going to practice this. We're going to do this together. Um, I, and I, I would just encourage you as we sing to be stretched, to be stretched into something new. As, like I said, our aim is to be worshipers in spirit and in truth. Worshippers that glorify and enjoy God as his Holy Spirit is energizing and awaking us. And maybe that's where you need to be stretched today. Maybe you've been showing up to church and just trying to sing and worship, and it's just felt like on your own strength. And that'll last maybe two, three weeks before you just start sitting down or stop coming, because it's, it's not easy. But maybe the stretch for you today is to ask him as we're singing, Lord, fill me. You promised to fill me. Fill me, Holy Spirit. Teach me to worship. Teach me to enjoy and glorify you today. Or maybe the stretch for you is to sing a spontaneous spiritual song to him. Now, you don't have to sing this loud enough for everybody around you to hear. God has great hearing. You can just quietly voice your thanks and love for him in a simple way. I mean, sometimes it's just a matter of saying, I love you. I mean, you don't have to come up with some deep theological treatise that you turn into a song on the spot, but just saying, I love you. I love you. And saying it over and over again and just starting to put some notes to it and letting your heart sing a song. I mean, you could even sing the tune of Happy Birthday and put I love you Jesus to it. And that's a spiritual song. That could be your stretch today. Or maybe the stretch for you is you only sing spiritual songs when you come here. You don't like the songs we pick and you're just singing your own thing. And the stretch for you today would be open up the Psalms and pray and sing the written word of God and be anchored to it today. Maybe that's the stretch. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the physical response to it. And you're like, I used to feel like I'm not lifting anything. I'm going to look strange. And, and, but I, like I said, nobody's going to notice or not notice. And I would encourage you with a, a middle ground step of just putting your hands out. This is like a great, like, like on your way to lifting your hands if you don't want to test the strength of your deodorant quite yet. You know, just hands out up front. That's, that could be the stretch for you today. But I just want us all to be stretched into what God has for us today. So as the team leads us, would you join me in standing? I'm going to pray, and then we're going to do this together. Jesus, I, I thank you. I'm so glad you found that woman at the well and that it was recorded for our benefit. I'm so glad you sought her out. I'm so glad that you got to the heart of the matter. 
I'm so glad that you transformed her life and called her to be a worshiper in spirit and truth. You sought her out where nobody else was looking. So Jesus, I pray that you would seek us out this morning, wherever we're hiding, whatever we have going on, wherever we feel awkward or uncomfortable or tired or overlooked or ashamed or embarrassed. Jesus, come seek us out and teach us to be worshipers in spirit and in truth. Holy Spirit, come fill us and anoint our song as we love you. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantbicelia.com. Until next time. There is a heavenly city that I'm compelled to find. Oh, I love the flowers and trees and the smell of the grinding sea. And all the beautiful things here in life. And I-